Hi, I'm Wyatt Cash with Scoop News Group, and we're excited to be here today talking to Jim Richberg, public sector field CISO and vice president of information security at Fortinet. Jim, thank you so much for being with us today. Wyatt, it's great to be here with you. Thanks. Well, it's well known that government agencies have a lot of data that cyber criminals want and that threat actors will go to great lengths to go get it. But recent supply chain attacks and data exposures have really shown that cyber criminals have become much more sophisticated and they're expanding their attack methods as organizations continue to implement new work from anywhere initiatives and expand their network capabilities. So Jim, let me start by asking, um, can you share some of your perspectives of some of the ways that you know, cyber criminals are, are really adapting their techniques and what government leaders really should be paying attention to now? That's a great question, Wyatt. And, and my answer is informed both by my decades doing this in government, but also by the fact that Fortinet's got the world's largest footprint of security devices and that we're seeing potentially malicious activity in literally half a million customer organizations around the world. And we've got this 24 seven global threat research team that's giving us original insight into what we're seeing. And, and from that data, government is one of the most targeted sectors out there. It's targeted about three times as much as the, the typical part of our, of our economy would be. And I normally tell organizations, especially in the private sector, who are resource challenged, you don't have to be the best out there. You just have to be good enough that they're going to go on to somebody who's a softer target. The problem is that doesn't apply to government. Government has a high bar. It has to defend itself both against the opportunistic private profit-driven criminal groups and these more dedicated, motivated nation-state teams. And we often say the nation-state teams are identified as the, the APT, the Advanced Persistent Threat Actor. They're not all sophisticated, and even the ones who are won't be good if they don't have to be, but they do tend to bring a lot to play against you with. And criminals, on the other hand, while there are criminal groups and syndicates who are really sophisticated, more activity on the criminal side has been a self-organized ecosystem. They may ultimately find the same vulnerability and evolve the same technique than an advanced group did, but they've typically been slower and noisier getting to that success line compared to an advanced group. The problem is the mashup of things like online black market auction sites and increased social media have meant that the criminals themselves are getting more like the advanced persistent threat actors. They're getting faster, they're getting more sophisticated across the board. And that means government now has to worry not only about nation state activity that's an advanced persistent threat, but more and more of these criminal groups bringing that same level of sophistication and stealth to operating against them. Well, and then turning the subject just briefly to things like operational technology or OT attacks uh, or supply chain attacks, you know, those aren't really new, but Clearly these attack methods are increasingly attractive to cyber criminals, I think, as you kind of alluded. So what should government leaders be aware of going forward to better secure their OT environments? Well, Wyatt, you talk to a lot of, of government organizations, especially people inside the Beltway and big headquarters, and they may say, we don't manufacture, we don't have operational technology. But the reality is with the rise of smart building technology, green energy savings, more public health monitoring, every building out there, every part of the federal infrastructure is going to have OT. And this OT is internet connected. Much of it isn't secure and it can't be upgraded. And this operational technology often becomes the path into the IT network. You may have all the firewalls and endpoint protections in the world on your classic information technology network, even a software defined one, but the, these intruders are increasingly going to look to come in through these operational technology pathways. And, and OT is now used for things like ransomware, which is not just a matter of encrypting your data in place, they're often now stealing it to reuse or sell as well. So now it's this mix of, I leave you dead in the water and I can use your data. So what do I say to do? Secure the endpoints where the operational technology devices touch your network. IoT can't promiscuously connect to every device on your network. You probably have points where you want it to come in through. And a lot of these devices, while they can't be secured, can take advantage of a technique like virtual patching. If I can't fix the device, but I know what the exploit is, 
I will apply that kind of fix where it touches my network. So there are ways to work around the weaknesses to channel how you let these devices interact with your network. But operational technology is a real is a reality federal government's having to deal with now. Well, and certainly with people working from home and all the devices in their house that have sensors and everything else, the, the attack surface just seems to be growing exponentially. Next, let me um, talk about another trend we're hearing. You know, threat actors are clearly increasingly using AI tools as well, and not just social engineering to mount their attacks on uh, government agencies and organizations. Curious, what, what are you hearing and seeing in terms of these more sophisticated security challenges? So I, had, you know, as, as we know, spear phishing, the social engineering of the user by email is still one of, if not the leading way that malicious actors penetrate networks. And we tell the users to look for things like clues in the email, an unknown sender, fracture English, uh, or somebody sending you a strange email, even if you know them. But open source content generation software for AI and I un underscore that open source, things you can find on GitHub has gotten good enough that from a small sample, it can generate something that even an AI expert can't tell you didn't come from their purported sender. So now agencies are gonna have to look for threat actors who not only steal your credentials and your address book so they know who to send things to, they'll steal some of your email, your inbox and your outbox. And they're gonna use these open source AI tools they'll be able to send emails to everybody in your address book in the style and syntax of the language you use. The fact that you talk to your boss and your mom differently and about the topics that they discuss. So the classic ways we train users to look for the signs of spear phishing are frankly not gonna work as the intruders get smarter at using AI against us. Scary. Well, and, then, and then lastly, um, just wanted to just briefly explore the, you know, the new trillion dollar infrastructure bill recently signed by the president increases funding for um, a number of cyber security initiatives. Can you talk about, you know, what are the biggest opportunities with that funding that, you know, agency leaders should be alert to, to improve their security posture as we head into 2022? Sure, Wyatt. Now, the, the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill has, I think it's over 275 places where it mentions cybersecurity, and it dedicates billions of dollars to cybersecurity. But the reality is those funds are going to go to other organizations to spend. They're not going to be spent by the federal government. It's things like the Technology Modernization Fund that are going to fund the, the IT and security upgrades the federal government uses. Now, Government has carrots and sticks. It can create incentives or it can levy requirements. And some of these federal agencies will be administering this infrastructure money across the country. They'll be setting requirements uh, in areas ranging from broadband access to energy, water, and highway. U.S. government knows how to do this. So that's something that's a matter of saying, give you more, more of the same that you know how to do as an agency. But Wyatt, this is also the opportunity for us to be creative, to think big. The money's going to flow and no one sets out to buy something and be insecure. But the reality is smaller companies and local government procurement staff are not cybersecurity experts. They don't know enough to write effective contract requirements as they spend this money. So imagine if we said, look, let's put together a library of existing federal government contract language from a variety of sources, Defense Department, GSA, CISA, on topics ranging from AI to zero trust that these organizations could look to to say, here's a good starting point, or here's language that the vendor community already knows how to deliver services against because they do that for the federal government. This is a way of using this infrastructure money to say, we're gonna build cybersecurity in a flexible, scalable, forward-looking direction into things that are gonna be around with us for a long time. We're dealing with infrastructure in some cases, things like water that started in the 1890s. So take this as a once in a century opportunity to build cybersecurity into this infrastructure. That's certainly a powerful suggestion and uh, uh, really appreciate your mentioning that. Well, Jim Richberg, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for joining us and sharing your insights and observations with us today. I enjoyed the conversation, Wyatt. Thanks for having me here. And uh, we want to thank our audience as well for tuning in.